okay assalamu alaikum students uh, this is uh, lecture number 2 uh, for electric machinery fundamentals and today we are actually officially starting chapter number 1 for our book uh, just let me write down the book name over here the book from which i am actually at present uh, completing this is electric machinery fundamentals So, Electric Machinery Fundamentals by Stephen J. Chapman. It's a very uh, old book, but uh, very competitive book and uh, maybe a little bit orientation or the uh, order of topics is a little not according to what I do or what normally students or the people actually understand but still a very good book so today we are actually talking on chapter number one from here and hopefully uh, we will also do chapter number one from the other book that is the Fitzgerald over here okay last lecture we talked about the motor the DC motor and I gave you the stator and rotor construction and how the motor works the Fleming's left hand rule and then you can apply the same uh, mechanism for Fleming's right hand rule for a generator. Uh, today, um, I am more concerned about because before we go into more deep into the magnet, uh, the problems of a machine or whatever, we want to actually see that what are magnetic circuits. You are familiar with electrical circuits up till now. You have done that one in your CAD and in your CAD, you have been drawing in your CAD course, what you have been doing, supposedly that was a simple circuitry that was a DC source over there and you had uh, a simple resistor over there this was an electric circuit the current was flowing I'm assuming conventional current over here so there was a current flowing over there because of the voltage applied across that resistor then if it can be an AC source but I'm not going to go towards the AC source at present because uh, our chapter number one is more limited towards the uh, single DC source up till now. Now magnetic circuits. What is magnetic circuit? A magnetic circuit is that kind of a circuit in which instead of the current, the flow is of the flux. So the flux is actually flow and we all know flux is having the units of phi. Uh, sorry, the symbol is phi and the units are Weber. I guess this is clear to you. And if you still don't remember it, I would like you to revise all this flux flow and the other parameters of a magnetic circuit so instead of current inside a magnetic circuit there is a flux flow so uh, there is a phi over there and i'm talking about something in millivebers in a transformer it can be mm, two milliweber three milliweber or whatever that flux may be and then uh, this flux uh, is giving rise to a uh, magnetic field and that magnetic field has two parameters which we call as the magnetic field density and magnetic field intensity now i hope these two are very much clear to you because you have gone through your physics and magnetism course so i hope your ex teacher whoever has taught that course has gone through so magnetic flux density you all remember that was b and magnetic flux intensity so if uh, i have uh, to draw a difference between b and h over here the density is actually telling you that how many uh, flux lines are passing through a unit area over there so the units uh, for b uh, if the units of flux for weber for flux density it will be weber per meter square or it can be tesla also in the famous tesla unit and then what was h h was the magnetic field intensity so the units of this one was ampere turns per meter over here and the famous uh, ampere's law also uses the magnetic flux intensity so i hope the ampere's law is also well to you now uh, when I'm talking about B and H a very simple statement over here that how B and H are related to each other uh, intensity actually tells us that 
how much force is being applied to produce that magnetic field and how much force is being applied this is governed by the ampere's law over here so i h and b uh, one is the causing agent the other one is the effect over there so h is actually the causing agent the b that is actually the magnetic field density is the uh, produced thing over there which means how many flux lines are being produced in some unit area over there and i hope you are all familiar with the very important uh, equation that is b is equal to mu naught h which is material dependent or material property dependent over there or this can also be written as b is equal to mu naught mu r h so uh, what was mu naught mu naught was the permittivity of free space and what was mu r mu r was the relative permittivity so these equations have been all been there up till now now uh, let's just talk first of all about ampere's law then i will add uh, to over here uh, just let me add another page over here on this one okay okay well i have to add this one okay so first of all if you let me talk about the ampere's law i hope uh, i'm not going to do the definition of it because uh, you all are familiar you must have cramped that definition before everything but if i write down the ampere's law in the equation form it was a closed integral so h dot dl was equal to i net so i hope this is clear to you how this equation actually came into uh, over there so if i have a small supposingly let me draw a 3 uh, d core so if i have so this is my So if I'm drawing a three-phase core, so this is my a simple ferromagnetic material. What I have done over here is this, that, uh, sorry about this one. This is a little, not straight line. Uh, anyway. So, and if I complete the path over here, okay, so this is my uh, material and uh, if I have to show some flux over here, certainly this means that I have to put some winding on it and that winding is going to go on this limb and this is one simple winding over here like this and this is coming out and over here without showing the source this means that current i is going inside of this and then coming out as an i current now if you see this one and uh, supposedly there are n turns over here so what it means that the same i current is actually flowing n times over there so now when i want to find out the uh, or apply the ampere's law over here so what i have to do over here is this that supposingly the flux which is being produced and this is uh let me use another color over here in fact let me use this uh, maybe green color that will be a little better so this is the flux flow and assuming all the flux is flowing in the center of the bow which is practically not true so because this is just an assumption and if you use the right hand rule i'm not not really having the hand in front of you but still if you are using the right hand rule the fingers are curled in the direction of the uh, winding current so this is the direction of the flux so this is the flux flow now flux is actually flowing over here in the whole material but uh, we are assuming it it is flowing at the center of the core where all the flux is assuming over there so what does ampere's law suggest over here the ampere's law suggests over here that if you are having a 
closed path and if you want to find out the total net current enclosed over there so if you are supposedly starting from this point you have to complete the whole path a closed path that's why the integral sign and with the closed integral sign is there so then you are going to have very very small like supposing what i mean by very small so you are going to have like this one small small segments and each segment are of dl length so you are going to complete the whole path and you are just going to add up all the multiplications of h dot dl now what is h over there h is the force that is producing that flux inside this material over there so h dot dl is going to be so what will be supposedly what i mean by this supposedly if i'm talking about this one so this will be h1 dot dl for this one this will be h2 dot dl for the third one this will be h3 dot dl so when you are going to complete this for the whole closed path you are going to add them together so integration you are actually adding them together so this is just h dot dl what i mean by that that h is constant this is very important h is constant over there assuming the material is homogeneous and assuming that the force that is being exerted now if you see very carefully over here from where the force is originating that force is being originated from the winding which is having a current i flow through it so when it is having a current i flow through it what is happening actually the force is being produced by this winding having a dc current over there but i am assuming that that force is distributed to the whole rectangular source over there it's not confined in one way so i'm assuming that h to be constant throughout and multiplying it by dot dl and then this is going to be equal to the net current enclosed which means this is i net now what does i net mean i net means that how much current is producing that force now here this is this i current but when i have made that wire n times over there so this is going to be equal to n i very simply so that's why whenever in a solenoid or even an electromagnet you are increasing the amount of flux how you are increasing the amount of force that is actually the magnetic field intensity over there so h dot dl is equal to ni now assuming for this integral sign over here that h same which is maybe not same but assuming is homogeneous and the whole winding is homogeneously spread through the whole rectangular one so i'm assuming that this is h and multiplying it by lc now what is lc over here this is very important lc is this length uh, let me use some other color over here okay so lc is this length over here at the center of the core so this length is called as the mean length of the core c is the subscript here and lc stands for the core mean length of the core so maybe uh, just for example uh, if this dimension was equal to like 20 centimeter this dimension over here was equal to supposedly 15 centimeter and uh, the inside diameter let me just give it an idea this was equal to something like 16 centimeters and this dimension oh sorry uh, this is uh, just dropped and this dimension was equal to so this is equal to this is 15 so 15 minus 4 this is equal to 11 centimeter now i want to find out because i have assumed that all the flux is flowing in the center of the core so this means that if i want to find out from this point to this point so this is 20 minus whatever that thickness so you can have this distance over here and you can add this distance for, for example this is 15 minus 11 so this distance uh, this distance over here is equal to 4 centimeter and this distance is also equal to 4 centimeter so this means if this is 20 so 20 minus uh, 2 here 2 here so this is equal to 
16 here and then if this is 15 and then 15 minus 4 that is 11 so this means the mean length of the core is equal to 16 plus 11 and then repeat it by 16 plus 11 so this comes out to be 32 plus 22 so this comes out to be i guess 54 uh, i hope i have not done anything mathematical wrong so this is 32 plus 22 so this is 54 centimeter is the mean length so this means that h dot lc is equal to ni so if i want to now find out h over here h is equal to ni divided by lc n number of turns i already know it because i have done the winding the current i i already have that value because whatever and lc is the mean length which i am actually going to have so i can just put in the values and from here you can easily see the units of this h are coming on that are since n is the number of turns i is the current over there so this is ampere turn per meter so if you go a little bit back to your diagram so how many ampere turns per meter so if this distance decreases this lc decreases which means the size of this ferromagnetic material or material is small force is going to be more why because lc is coming in denominator so this ampere's law is telling you a relationship this is actually the backbone of the relationship between an electric circuit and a magnetic circuit here in this one the only magnetic thing is h over here but the electrical thing is n i over here in fact n is the, just the number of turns it's a repetition and the physical property is over here is for the lc so this is ampere's law is actually a combination or combining the electric one with the magnetic one over there so using this ampere's law we all now have h is equal to n i by l c over here and we already know that b is equal to mu h now what how these are related this is a very important one and we're just going to go through the proof over here just now so over here uh, in this one what is h over there h is the force exerted this is the force exerted by the current because current is actually producing this h over there inside the material so this is the force exerted by the current to establish a magnetic field i'm just going to use some abbreviation so that uh, it saves me some time you can do it and what is mu over here mu is the relative I'm not going to write a definition. I'm just giving you some statements so that it's easy to grasp the idea. So this is the relative ease of establishing a magnetic field in a given material. So you can see very carefully now that B, what is B now? What is this? H is the force exerted by the current to establish a magnetic field. Mu is the relative ease. Now, if material is going to have a bigger mu, which means that its properties are better, it allows magnetic field to flow. So what will happen? More flux lines will flow. And what is more flux lines means that B is going to in the fire side. What is B? B is the magnetic flux density or the magnetic field density which is having the units of webers per meter square so i hope you are getting the idea h is equal to ni by lc tells you the ampere's law that is giving you from the electrical to the magnetic field so on this side this is h which is actually a magnetic field parameter so from the electrical current with n number of turns you are getting the flow of magnetic flux and then this formula b is equal to mu h is actually telling you that if h is there now one thing very important if you get a material because this mu is equal to mu naught mu r you're already familiar with this one in your previous classes so what was mu r that was the relative permeability air has a relative permeability of one now if you take some iron or ferromagnetic material that mu r may be like something 1000 2000 over there so this means the material that is ferromagnetic material or steel or something that is 2000 times better than air and i hope i don't need to repeat over here that the mu naught value is 4 pi into 10 raised to power minus 7 and write down the unit 
So this is telling you that if you have some steel or some ferromagnetic material or something like that, your material is going to be that much time. So supposingly it's a mu R of 2000 or 3000, then this mu is going to be better. So what it means that in steel or whatever that material may be, B is going to be more. So that's why I told you that in a DC motor, the yoke has to be made of some ferromagnetic material. Otherwise, if it's air, flux density will not be there and then flux will not flow. When flux will not flow and it's not going to complete the path from north to south pole, the machine will not have that flux over there. And if it will not have flux, it will not have the force generated over there. So, okay. Now, I have now these two formulas over here and I, uh, I've told you that H is equal to Ni by LC. Uh, in fact, sorry, let me just write it down as denominator. I have B is equal to mu naught mu R H. This is a very important one. And I hope so. I don't need to tell you that uh, what is mu R. It's the mobility of the material to allow the magnetic field. There's some just definitions over there. And we know mu naught. I just told you that 4 pi into 10 raised to power minus 7 Henry per meter over here. Now, uh, now, the, using these two equations over here, this is very much important over here. What I'm going to do now, let me call this one as A equation. You can call the, I, I can write it as actually as also as simply B is equal to mu H and I can call it B. I can replace it with mu naught mu R. It's totally up to me over here. Now, if I have a single turn, uh, same thing over here, supposedly, I have something like this over here. I'm not going to draw the diagram. In fact, let me just take this. Uh, Okay, I'm just going to so okay, so same thing over here and assuming it that I have uh, the second equation which is equal to mu b is equal to mu h and I can take the uh, first equation here the value of h and put in so putting the value so putting the value of h and b so i have it over here b is equal to mu h which will now be changed to mu and h is equal to oh, sorry this is not uh, just done it wrong over here so this is, uh, in fact, let me just rub this one. So, okay. So this is equal to mu and this will be Ni divided by LC. So now I have is equal to another equation. And over here, I know that B is equal to mu H over here. And from here, I can also write that H is equal to B over mu naught mu r so i have now two three equations over here another one so this is equal to and i also know now those of you who have studied physics previously and so have an idea that what was flux equal to flux phi was equal to b dot a so what this means over here if i want to uh, convert this one so this is equal to b equal to flux phi divided by a so if I replace this one in this second equation over here, so I know my H is equal to, this is flux phi over mu naught mu R A. So what I have now, this is, you can call it as one equation. And this one is another one. I can call this one as supposingly that was A and B. I can call this one as C. And then I have it over here, this one as D. Now, uh, if you see over here, uh, in fact, this one is E. Let me just write it down. This is E and this is my D equation. Now, if you see equation number uh, over here, equation number E over here, and if you see the uh, equation I had over here, H is equal to Ni by LC. Now, based on this one, equation number E and equation number A, so if you equate 
E and A. So just write it down over here. So this is equal to flux phi divided by mu naught mu r A, where A is actually the area, cross-sectional area. This is very important because in this flux formula, A was the cross-sectional area. And this is equal to N i divided by L c. So now if I just do a little bit uh, rearrangement of this one, the flux phi, I have taken out B and H. Why I have taken them out of this equation? Because they are actually the output parameters. B is actually going to be the flux density. But these parameters I can know for any material. That's why I have written this equation in this form. So the flux phi is equal to Ni and this will be equal to. Now this is very important. If I am going to take this mu r mu naught A on the above side over here. So I can write this one as over here. Lc divided by mu naught mu r a. So this is all in the denominator. So now this means that this equation, what is this telling me? Now, if you see over here, let me write it down this equation again over here. The flux phi is equal to ni divided by lc divided by mu naught mu r a now here since a is the uh, cross-sectional area so here i am also going to write a subscript ac so now if you see this equation what this equation is this equation is just analogous to the the ohm's law equation that was i equal to v divided by r just compare these two. Now, if you see the comparison over here, phi is equal to Ni divided by Lc divided by, over here. In the, uh, on, if you see on the left hand side, what you have, you have flux phi, you have I. What this means that flux phi is flowing inside a magnetic circuit. So in a magnetic circuit, you have flux phi. But in an electric circuit, you have a current I, which is completely true. And if you see on the other side, that is the right hand side, in the numerator, you have an I. What is an I? An I is the force creating agent or the supply that is producing that flux over there. And in an electric circuit, what is V? V is the electromotive force that is being produced over there. So certainly this means that here in an electric circuit there was R. What was this R? R was the resistance offered in an electric circuit. So in the denominator you have over here LC divided by mu naught mu R AC. So this is going to be the resistance of a magnetic circuit. The resistance of that magnetic material so that you have the flux flowing through it. Now, we don't call it as a resistance of magnetic circuit. We call it as the reluctance, this italic symbol over there. So this is called as the reluctance of that material. Now if you see very closely over here, what is reluctance? This is telling me or this formula is telling me that reluctance is proportional to LC. Now why it is proportional to LC? More the length of the circuit, it will take more time, it will take more effort from Ni to actually have the flux flow. So this is completely true now because the material is not ideal it's not that ideal so what you are having over here this is directly proportional the reluctance or the resistance of the magnetic circuit now at not time i'm talking about the magnetic flow so reluctance is proportional or directly proportional to lc which is the mean length and if you see over here the reluctance is inversely proportional to area of the core why because if this material, what is the area of the core over here? If I just uh, see on this one, let me just uh, show it by another one. So this is this length and this length. So if I have, supposedly, I just draw a simple circuit, uh, cross-sectional area. This is that cross-sectional area. I just drawn it as a 3D. And this one is AC. 
the cross sectional area and how you are going to find it out you are going to find out this length multiplied it by this length this is the cross sectional area from the area in which the flux lines are flowing so this means that more the area of course lesser the resistance so this is going to be this cross proportional and if you see over here your r is also inversely proportional to mu and what is mu mu is equal to mu not mu r now what was mu mu was the ability of the material to actually allow it now if your mu r is on the higher side so this is reciprocal so what this means r or reluctance is going to be small so mu now if you take a hypothetical material supposedly and you have that mu r approaching to infinity what this means this means that your mu is also going to approach to infinity and this means that your reluctance is going to be equal to zero now such type of material does not exist because mu r has some finite value it does not have an infinite value so reluctance just like any conductor a magnetic circuit also has a reluctance being offered and that reluctance is given by this formula that is lc divided by now very interesting thing you have uh, the let me go through this one so we just now did it that reluctance is equal to lc divided by mu naught mu r ac so this is the reluctance formula now those of you who still remember a little bit of from your physics you are remembering it that r the resistance in electric circuit that was equal to rho l over a now for those of you who still don't remember it this was the cross section of the wire this was the cross section area of that resistance or wire because resistance is always taken for some wire or something like that this was the length certainly if the length of wire is more you're going to have and what was this one this one was the resistivity so you can see these both are so much related here this resistivity is coming in numerator because this is a reciprocal as such because this is assisting the more the resistivity the more the resistance here this one which is equal to mu this is coming in denominator why because this is the permeability that is how your material is going to behave or are going to allow the material to have flux flow through it so this is very much important and you can change this one you can change this one so you can call just like this is resistivity you can call it reluctivity and this reductivity will be equal to 1 over mu naught mu r same thing just like this was your permeability this one was your permeability this one was equal to mu naught mu r if you inverse it so this is equal to you can call it as p over here and this is reluctivity over here that is in fact don't call it just now permeability i will talk about it in a later one over there so you have reluctivity and permeability for a magnetic circuit and similarly in an electric circuit you have resistivity over there in this one so i hope this is clear over here that in an electric circuit and a magnetic circuit you have the flux flowing over there so in any material over there you have always a uh, current flowing in electric circuit and you have in a magnetic circuit flux flowing now just one simple thing very important one which we normally uh, do it over here let me just draw it over here uh, that is the differences between an electric circuit and a magnetic circuit because normally whenever you are comparing two circuits you have to have a little comparison between an electric circuit and a magnetic circuit because they both have a complete analogy with each other so this means that you have to do a comparison so i'm just drawing a small comparison sheet over here so and sometimes it's being asked in the exams also so just doing a comparison now in magnetic circuit the flow is of flux here the flow is of current or in other words you can call it electrons also 
because I am talking about the conventional or sorry the non-conventional current over there. So if I'm talking about let's just talk in terms of the equations. So in a magnetic circuit, the flux phi is equal to uh, now coming back to a little bit now. This is very important because I did not do that. The flux phi, if you remember the previous uh, equation, we did just it now. This was equal to Ni divided by this reluctance. So I can write down this one as Ni divided by reluctance formula. So what this means over here, what is this Ni? Similarly, just like in your electric circuit, the equation was I is equal to V divided by R. What was V? V was the electromotive force. Here I am going to call this Ni as MMF, which is called as magnetomotive force. Uh, magnetomotive, uh, please check the spelling, maybe I have done something wrong. Magnetomotive, so magnetomotive force, MMF. So over here, I can write it that flux formula is equal to MMF divided by reluctance. Or I can write it in equation form as Ni divided by reluctance. And in electric circuit, we already know the current I is equal to V divided by R. Or you can call it as simply as EMF divided by resistance. Over here. Then uh, in, uh, I guess if you want to just, just increase the number of differences, you can write it as that the flux over here, the uh, MMF over here, oh sorry, first of all MMF, MMF, the units are ampere turns. And here, this is EMF, uh, the certainly the units are volts because there's the voltage and here in it is the flux so we call it as Weber here this is current I we call it as ampere over here and uh, then after this flux phi uh, you can call on the reluctance over here the reluctance the units are now what is units over here very important one the reluctance units over here you can use ohms it's totally up to you just like it over there you want to use ohms you can go with the ohms one over there which is a little better if you want to write reluctance in terms of this equation over here so you can easily write it ampere turns per Weber because what is reluctance equal to reluctance is equal to n i divided by oh sorry not uh, reluctance this is wrong n i divided by uh, flux just changing that one over there so I have over here reluctance unit coming out ampere turns divided by Weber so the units are ampere turns per Weber. So over here, reluctance, ampere, turns per Weber. And here, the units for R is, please don't miss this uh, italic sign over here, the italic R, otherwise it confuses it with the electric circuit R over there. And we already know this is equal to ohms or whatever you want to write it on. So this is ampere turns per Weber. Then uh, there are some other, you can write down the formula also. The reluctance formula is LC divided by mu naught, mu R, AC, and here R is equal to rho L over A. Let me add another page so I can write down more over here. And then uh, I told you about the reluctance. So then this means I have to talk on the permeance also. What is permeance? Permeance is the reciprocal of reluctance. This is very much important. Just like P symbol, just like it just mistakenly wrote it there. So this is equal to the inverse. And in electric circuits, you know resistance is there. What is the inverse of resistance? We call that one as conductance. You already are familiar with this one. The conductance is equal to certainly the reciprocal of resistance. So, and if I write down in units, that is G, that is equal to 1 over R over there and then I guess I don't need to uh, write it down but let me just write it again here that is reluctivity over here and here there is resistivity we have done it 
just now previously in the last slide and then there is permeability we already know that in magnetic circuit we have a permeability which is equal to certainly 1 over reluctivity so this was 1 over mu naught mu naught r this was permeability was mu naught mu r and here this is in this one this is going to be conductivity uh, conductivity is equal to 1 over activity and the one and last thing very much important in electric circuits you have the total emf for a series circuit now this is very much important total emf for a series circuit by which i mean that i have one resistance i have another resistance i have another resistance i have another resistance and i have this voltage source added this one is r1 resistance this one is r2 this one is r3 this one is r4 this one is r5 one and good no issues but the voltage drop over here the voltage drop over here the voltage drop over here the voltage drop voltage drop you add them together since it's a series circuit so this means i can assume the current i and this i can call it ir1 plus ir2 plus ir3 plus ir4 and uh, I have actually added uh, five resistances. So this will be IR5. Similar thing can happen in a magnetic circuit. The only thing change would be that here, this will be MMF, that is NI, and that will be equal to uh, flux phi over here, multiplied by the reluctance of the first material plus if it's a series, certainly this is a series over there. So flux into R2 plus flux into R3 and whatever it can be up till R5 or whatever, how many materials are there. What I mean by this is this, supposingly, uh, let me just draw a simple case and So I'm actually drawing a three dimensional here so that it's uh, so you got this one. Okay, so now what I have done over here let me just zoom it a little bit. I have added a small gap over here and what advantage will I get because of this gap or disadvantage I will get you will just see now. Uh, in fact, okay, sorry, I have to complete the diagram over here. This is so. This is my uh, core, and on this one, I have this winding done. This is my winding done on the. Uh, I can have a DC source attached over here. It can be simple current flowing inside the winding now if you see very closely over here the flux lines which are going to flow supposingly they are flowing in this above direction and they move on up till this point they encounter air gap this distance over here is air gap so now when flux is going to be calculated, this is a series circuit because the flux has to pass through two mediums. So over here, the total reluctance, R total, is going to be equal to R1 plus R2. What I mean by that? R1 is going to be the reluctance of the core, this one, that is this path, and R2 can be called as R air and that is going to be the reluctance of the air gap. 
Now remember one thing very important when you are going to calculate for R1 which is actually R core you will find it out by LC divided by mu naught mu R AC. What is mean length? Mean length means from here to here to add up and have till this point. And AC is going to be the cross sectional area. So this is going to be. Then I have R air. So that R air is going to be equal to LC divided by mu naught AC. Here this time there is air gap. So there is no mu R. So mu naught mu R. So you can easily see that in the denominator you have in R1 or R core, this is actually the core. So when you are going to have mu R here, but mu naught not in the second R air, this means that this reluctance that is R air is going to be very much higher than R core, almost whatever that mu R is, supposing that is 2000, so it will be 2000 times more there. Yes, there will be a distance over here. The LC here is different. Here this will be called as LG. And what is that LG? LG is this length of the air gap. So R air is certainly going to be more than the R core over there. Now, one thing very important, let me just take this diagram on the other page. So if I have another diagram let me just paste it over here okay now if you see this one this is a magnetic uh, circuit now you want to convert this circuit into its equivalent circuit this is very much important over here so just like you draw an electric circuit you are going to convert this three-dimensional magnetic material which is having some current flowing through and there are some windings and there are n turns certainly over here so when you are going to convert this circuit you are going to have a MMF source just like this one and I'm going to call it NI N is the number of turns I is the current flowing over there and the reluctance being offered over here like this this will be R core this will be R air and when you have added those two together certainly when adding those two together applying simple circuit rules you can find out our total which will be equal to our core plus our air so the flux which is oh, sorry not it will be not uh, i it will be flux phi flowing over here so when you are going to find out flux phi flux phi will be equal to ni divided by r core plus r air or you can just put in the total value over here and certainly you can find it. but due to this air gap the magnetic field circuit is having now two reluctances now instead of just one air gap supposingly just for example i had uh, another air gap over here supposing this was another air gap now if you see in this air gap this was lg1 supposedly this is lg2 so now what would happen now this is very interesting over here since if the cross sectional area of the core is same then you can assume from here up till this point uh, over here from this point to this point and then this point to this point wherever i have this highlighter over here you can add all that mean length and take it as r core and for this air gap this one it will be another resistance over here added and i can call it r air 2 this will be r air 1 so what will be r core our core is going to be this reluctance from here sorry this one and this one wherever my highlight is there but assuming that the core cross-sectional area is the same why because when you are going to find out our core that will be equal to lc divided by mu naught mu r ac 
So what is LC over here? LC is this distance in the center from here to here and this one. So when you add all these together, certainly dimensions will be given to you. So you can have mu naught, you already know the value, mu r into 10 to the power minus 7, mu r will be given to you as something 2000 or whatever, a cross-sectional area if this is a uniform cross-section. Otherwise, if it is not, supposingly, if it is not over there, then what you are going to do, supposingly this is having a different cross-sectional area, this one is having a different cross-sectional area. Now what you will do then, you will have a very different circuit now. And this time, you will have this one and this one. This will be called as R core 2. This will be R core 1. This will be R air 2. So now, what is this material going to be? Let me uh, just highlight it. This material, this material will be R core 2 and this material over here which I am highlighting at present this one would be uh, let me write it down R core 1. So I have one resistance over here, one resistance over here. So now when I'm going to find out R core 1, that will be equal to LC1 divided by mu naught mu R AC1 because that is a different area, different core length. Then for R core 2, because that's a different material, that is the one two. So this will be LC2 divided by mu naught mu r a c2 maybe the material is also different so maybe their mu r are also different so that is also possible so when i'm having this uh, one r core one is this material so you will find out the reluctance like this if mu mu r both are same otherwise if they are not then certainly you have to and then for r core two this is one is the and similarly, you can do it for LG1 and LG2, just like this. So whenever you have a circuit in front of you, the first thing first, convert it into its equivalent circuit. So whenever you have a three-dimensional model over there, please convert it into your circuitry over here. So this is, uh, uh, I'm just going to do a small numerical here in front of you. And then we can just finish it off over here. So I have, I have to draw one actually, let me just take it from the same diagram. Uh, where is my diagram? Okay. Um, okay, I can take this one. This is a little, okay. Uh, let me just paste it here. So that's easy for, okay. So what I've done over here, uh, in fact, let me take off this air gap. Air gap is not there, for example. So, air gap is not existing. It's just a simple core. And in the simple core, what is the value of current that is flowing? Current value is uh, 2 amperes. N over here is equal to 200. Mu R of the material is equal to 2500. And over here, very important, this dimension, let me use a, a little different one over here. Uh, so let me use it a little different one. This distance from here to here, this is 15 centimeter. And the cross-sectional area of this one, uh, AC, because this is a simple uniform core, nothing different, special over here. This is 15 into 10 centimeter which means that uh, the 15 is the front one and depth, this depth from here to here, this is equal to 10 centimeter. And then what is the distance over here? This distance from this distance to this distance and this distance. So I hope uh, this is a little clear now. This distance is equal to 15 centimeter. This distance to this distance is 30 centimeter. And again, this one to this one is 15 centimeter. And uh, this distance from here up till here 
is also 30 centimeters. So it's actually just a complete square. It's not giving you a full square uh, depiction from the 3D model, but it's over here like this. So now, uh, first of all thing, as I've told you previously, first of all, draw its equivalent circuit. What this means, there is only one source. So what I'm going to do, this is plus negative. Now this is one source. So I have over here, just one material. Now one change over here, that is that this dimension has been kept as 10 centimeter. This one is 15 centimeter. This one is 10 centimeter. Now what this will happen, the problem would be, this is 15 centimeter, this is 10 centimeter, this one is 10 centimeter. So this means that this shaded region, now see this very carefully, this shaded region from this one and here this shaded region is different from this shaded region over here I'm just doing this coloring so that uh, it's easy to understand so you can see now, these are now two different materials over here. So now when I am going to draw the equivalent circuit, I am going to have the first thing, uh, let me just use the yellow color because that is easy for actually view viewability. So I am going to have two reluctances and my circuit is complete. This is R1, this is R2. I need to find out flux phi flowing inside the core. Now, how I'm going to find out uh, the, let me just take this diagram, sorry, and, and let me add it on the next page. Okay. So now I have this diagram over here. Okay. So now I need to find out R1. What is R1? R1 is going to be equal to LC1 divided by mu naught mu R A C1. And what is R1? R1 is this bluish color shade. And what is R2? R2 is this greenish color or yellowish color shade over here. Now for R1, I need to find out LC1. Now what is LC1 over here? Now for LC1, what you need to do I need to have this distance traveled from here, up till here, up till here, up till here. Now I want to find out this distance over here. This distance will be 30 centimeter from here. Uh, let me just use uh, from here to here. This will be 30 centimeter. Then half of this thickness over here, this one, and then half of the thickness over here, this one then this distance traveled and then up till this point. Now I need to find out this length. This is the core mean length over here. So this is 30 centimeter. This distance is 15 centimeter. So this is going to be 15, 7.5 over here because this is half of it. So if this is 15, so half of it over here, this one would be 7.5. And this distance over here, now how you are going to find out this distance? This distance over here is going to be equal to any idea on this one please think on this one so this distance is 15 so half of this is also 7.5 so 7.5 plus 7.5 plus 30 okay 7 7.5 7.5 plus 30 so if i write need to write down first of all lc1 uh, let me use again the yellow color that is easy lc1 is equal to 30 centimeter plus 7.5 plus 7.5 so this is this distance from up till this point. Similarly, that will be same thing. So this will be 30 centimeter plus 7.5 plus 7.5 over here. So, and this distance from here to here, this is equal to, we already know this one, this is also 30 centimeter. So your R1 is going to be equal to 
if I now add all these together, let me write it down. So this is going to be 30 centimeter again, plus 7.5, plus 7.5 plus, and this one is 30 centimeter. So if you add all these together, this is 90 plus 15 plus 15. So this is 90 plus 30. So this is going to be equal to 90 centimeter plus 30 centimeter. This is equal to 120 centimeter. So this is going to be LC1. So now I need to find out R1. R1 would be equal to, now one thing very important, whenever you calculate the distance LC1 or whatever area, you can calculate it in centimeter or centimeter square or whatever. But when you are putting in this formula, please write it down in terms of SI unit. So this will be 120 minus 2 by minus 2 because this reluctance unit has to be calculated per SI units. Mu naught is 4 pi into 10 raised to power minus 7 into uh, the material is 2500 and cross sectional area. This is very important. The cross sectional area was written as 15 by 10 centimeter. So this means over here you are going to write it as 15 cross 10 multiplied by 10 raised to power minus 4 because this is centimeter square. Now you can find out your R1 that is reluctance. Now I'm not going to do the calculation. I will leave it up to you to do the calculation yourself. Now the second reluctance that is R2. What is that material? That material is this distance from this point, this one to this one. This is very important. Please don't ignore this thing and this thing. I could have added this one in the first material, which means that the first material mean length would have been calculated like this. But I have taken the whole material. This all is second material. So the mean length this time I'm going to calculate is going to be this. And this distance, if you see very carefully over here, this is 10 centimeter, this distance. So this means this is 5. This is 5. So 5 plus 5 plus this distance, this is going to be 30 plus 7.5 plus 7.5. So uh, just, just write down the equation first, LC2 divided by mu naught mu r into AC2. Now what is LC2? Here this will be equal to 5 centimeter plus 5 centimeter. From where I am taking this 5 centimeter, 5 here, 5 here, then 7.5 here, 7.5 here. So this will be, se uh, let me just change the color. So this is 7.5 plus 7.5 plus then 30 centimeter. So you just add them together. This comes out to be 10 plus 15, 25, 25 plus 30. This comes out to be 55 centimeter over here. So this is 55 centimeter. You can convert it into 0.55 meter. This is LC2 or you can just write it down over there. So now when you want to calculate R2, reluctance 2, this will be equal to 0.55 meter divided by mu naught, whatever that value, 4 pi into 10 to power 7, you can put it yourself. Mu r, since uh, material is the same, only thing is the dimensions are changed over there. So 2500 multiplied by, now area of the cross section core, this dimension was 10 into 10. So this time, this is going to be 10 into 10 multiplied by 10 raised to power minus 4, because these are in, these are in centimeter units over there. So this will be, so you can calculate your reluctance over there. So now when you have done your reluctance calculation for R1 and R2, okay, you can add these two and you can find out your total reluctance over here. And when you have found out your total reluctance, then it's very simple, just simple mathematics that your flux phi would be equal to Ni. And what is Ni? We already know this one. N is 200, I is 2 amperes. So you just have to put Ni divided by the total reluctance. So this flux phi would be equal to uh, 200 multiplied by uh, the current was sorry, uh, the 2 amperes. So this is 2 amperes divided by whatever reluctance you have found out. This is phi 2. And certainly, please don't miss the units. The flux phi is always going to be having a units of Weber's or milli Weber's or whatever. So I leave the calculation up to you. I hope you have got this uh, numerical over here. And one thing very important, please don't miss the units of reluctance also. As I've told you, the reluctance units are ampere turns per Weber. 
similarly flux units are in weber so this is very important that you take in control that what type over here so in this material or in this example let me just revise it you had the same material but two different dimensions over there why because this is a little thick this is 15 centimeter this is 10 centimeter so i have taken this material up till here so sometime when you are going to take it so mean length has to be calculated like this because we are assuming the flux is flowing in the center of the core and then the flux is flowing from here to here in the second material so you have to find out the flux so that and that flux is find out by ni divided by reluctance total over here so we have done this as chapter number uh, one from our chapman book and uh, almost i guess if i'm not wrong uh, I have covered uh, almost up till, please kindly go through uh, article, uh, example number 1.2, 1.3 yourself. I will talk about a little bit about the BH curve in the next lecture and then move on towards some other proofs over there. But this is approximately, uh, we have talked much about the magnetic circuits, its behavior, how the equivalent circuit. I will do one more numerical related to this one, maybe with an air gap in the next lecture. So I have approximately done from one up till 1.4 over here. <coughs> Sorry. <clears throat> so I hope this was an interesting lecture today. So uh, you have got an idea that how materials behave, how their magnetic circuits are being made. So we have talked about how any uh, magnetic circuit can be represented into its equivalent form how ampere's law tells us how the flux is actually telling us and how the differences between a magnetic circuit and electric circuit are there and then you have the uh, two materials or two air gaps over there and then we did this small numerical over here where we are actually finding out first of all the main thing uh, over here in a numerical is first of all drawing the diagram this is very important and then afterwards the reluctances which are very important the units are very important the pure terms for weber and then i have to calculate the flux phi over here so in this way you can do it very carefully over here so i hope this was uh, constructive and you have got a lot of understanding over here